Hugh White, welcome to ASPE. Nice to be back. Let's start with a central irony, a central truth, the entrapment, uh, abandonment tension in the alliance. And the, the irony in a way that the greatest threat to Australia's alliance with the US is always in some ways going to be the US, what the US demands or what the US fails to deliver. And you're starting to think that it's going to fail to deliver. Yes, well, I think traditionally Australians have worried more about entrapment than abandonment. We're worried that, that being an ally of the United States is going to drag us into wars we don't want to fight. And you think the you know, long history of debates about Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan and so on. But I, and that's, that's been a legitimate concern. But I think by far and away the bigger concern we face today is abandonment. That is that the United States ceases to play the role in Asia and the role in our security that we've wanted it to play and that our defence policy today continues to assume that it will play. Uh, you know, our, our whole defence policy is based on the idea that the United States will remain the dominant power in Asia and as such will prevent any major power challenge to Australia's security and that if for some reason that doesn't work out and we do face a threat from a major power, the United States will be there to defend us. And I think and the core argument I'm making in the book is that we can no longer base our defence policy on those assumptions and that's a very unsettling conclusion to reach because although we've often, which is the premise of your question, suggests being anxious about how much our alliances are demanding of us, we've tended to be fairly confident that come what may they would deliver for us. And that's what I think we now have to reconsider. Why do you say that China is going to win and the US is going to lose? Look, because in the end, China is more powerful relative to the United States than any adversary the United States has ever faced before. Just take the Australian Treasury's figures as given in the, the government's 2017 foreign policy white paper. In 2030, 11 years from now, they estimate China's GDP will be 42 trillion and America's will be 24. 42 to 24. America has never, since it emerged from isolationism at the end of the 19th century, America has never faced a power with an economy bigger than its own. Now, as China's power grows, as its wealth grows, its power grows, as its power grows, the costs and risks to the United States of trying to preserve its leadership role in Asia in the face of China's very clear challenge goes up. And the question then is, well, is America sufficiently committed to preserving its position in Asia to pay those higher costs and risks? And I'm very unpersuaded that they are. I think those costs and risks are going to be very high, not only because China is powerful, but because it's very resolved to establish itself as the leading power in East Asia and the Western Pacific. And I don't think American policymakers have seriously engaged with those risks, nor have they attempted to sell them to the American public, to persuade the American public that America must, in its own interests, remain the primary power in Asia at the price it will cost them to do so in the face of China's power and resolve. History says that the US does stay the course. It, it, it suffers a, a, a disastrous draw in Korea. It loses a yeah. war in Vietnam. Uh, it stays the course in the global competition with the Soviet Union. Yeah. Why would America not stay the course just because China is going to be pushing a bit in the region? Yes, really important question. Um, if we look back, and the premise of the question is right, the fact is, until now, America has always, when it's had moments of doubt, it's shaken itself and said, OK, let's go ahead. Um, but I think uh, the difference this time is that it's never faced a power in Asia or anywhere else as powerful as China is today. Remember that at the height of its power, in the middle of the Cold War, the Soviet Union never had an economy bigger than half the size of America's. China's 10 years from now is going to be near enough to twice the size of America's. I think for all the fact that we've talked about the rise of China to we're blue in the face in this town for a decade or two decades, we still haven't really caught on to what the rise of China means. It is the most fundamental shift in the distribution of global wealth and power since Australia was settled by Europeans. So I think that is, a, that is the, the, the first point. The second point is if we look back through America's history of engagement beyond the Western Hemisphere, ne never any trouble getting Americans to engage in the Western Hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine really is hardwired into the American strategic psyche. But the big question is what, what draws America to engagement beyond the Western Hemisphere? And I think there's a fairly consistent pattern here. 
repeatedly in 1917, in 1941, and again as the post-Cold War, as a post-World War II Cold War environment evolved in the late 40s, America faced the prospect that a single power or group of powers could dominate the whole of the Eurasian landmass. Germany, when it looked like it might win first the First World War, the Nazis and Imperial Japan in 1941, and the Soviets, of course, in the early days of the Cold War, in the late 40s and into the 50s. In all of those cases, America faced the very real threat that a single power would dominate the whole of Eurasia, and a power that could dominate the whole of Eurasia would have the power to threaten the United States at home in the Western Hemisphere. That, in the end, and it was a very good uh, essays by George Kennan on this uh, when he was writing after he retired from the State Department. That, in the end, is what's driven America out of the Western Hemisphere into global engagement. And, it's, and, and that's why, in the end, it ran the whole way through the Cold War with extraordinary commitment of American resources and risk and courage to win the Cold War. After the Cold War, there was very real doubt as to whether America would do that. And, you know, we tend to forget how uncertain Americans were in the early 90s about its future role in Asia. But in the end, it did decide to stay engaged in Asia. But why? Because it decided it was going to be cheap. In the 1990s, China was not resisting America's position as the leading power in Asia, neither was Japan. The United States was facing no contestation to its strategic position in Asia. Therefore, preserving primacy was cheap, and why wouldn't you do it? It was not going to cost you very much. What's different today is that America faces higher costs and risks because of China's power and resolve, and it doesn't have a commensurate um, imperative to preserve that leadership. And when the costs are high and the imperatives are low, I think the chances of that policy being sustained have got to be seen to be very low. If Donald Trump is, in some senses, the least strategic US president we're ever likely to see, the, the US president with least sense of history, least sense of a world beyond New York, um, even Trump is not, in the end, stepping back from Asia in the way that you're talking about. He, he's, he's fuming about the cost of alliances, but the, the, the Washington strategy that we're seeing coming out from the United States, the Indo-Pacific strategy, is not a withdrawal strategy. Well, a couple of points there. I, I'm not sure that Trump is the least strategic president we've ever seen. His strategy is different. Um, and I'm far from sure that Trump himself is committed to the new Cold War with China. He never talks about it. He, nev he personally never describes China as a strategic rival. He has a very strong focus of, on China as an economic rival. But the language of strategic rivalry, the language that we have seen coming out of Washington, and you're absolutely right, the language coming out of Washington in the last 18 months since the national security strategy of December 1917 through um, Vice President Pence's um, uh, Hudson Institute speech in, I guess, October last year and things we've seen since then, there's a very steady drumbeat of very assertive statements by the United States about the strategic rivalry they see from China and their commitment to resist. But, but Trump does not say it. And I think this is Trump being entirely consistent. Trump has a vision of America's um, strategic posture, which is quite Jacksonian. Um, that is that uh, America does not, in for like traditional therefore, sort of pre-20th uh, pre century, America does not set out to rule the world. It does not set out to lead the globe and bring salvation to mankind. It simply seeks to look after itself so if you threaten America, Donald Trump's strategy will reach out and grab you. But if you don't threaten America, then you're somebody else's problem. And Trump's approach to alliances has been completely consistent with that. Now, that's not to say that Trump might not get the United States into a war with China. But if he does, it won't be because China threatens American leadership in Asia. It's because China threatens his own sense of himself. I think he is potentially a dangerous leader, but a dangerous leader because of his personal sensitivities, his egocentricity, rather than a coherent strategic vision. And so under, what, under what circumstances do you see the US going to war with China? Uh, very important question. Neither America nor China, no one serious in Washington, no one serious I'm sure in Beijing, wants to see a war between these two powers. And that's good news, but it doesn't get you very far. One doesn't want to over-egg over these historical analogies, but you don't want to ignore them either. 
the real historical analogy with 1914 today is not that we've got a rising power meeting and established power, the sort of Thucydides argument, though of course that's true. But the real analogy, the one that sends a shiver down my spine, is the analogy between the situation we face today and the situation that the powers of Europe found themselves in in July, the second half of July, the last week of July 1914. Because in the last week of July 1914, none of the major powers wanted to go to war. But all of them believed they could get what they wanted without going to war because they believed the other side would back down. The Austrians thought they could punish the Serbs without getting, uh, being attacked by the Russians because they thought the Russians would let their Serbian allies down. The Russians thought they could attack the Austrians without going to war with the Germans because they thought the Germans would let their Austrian allies down. And so on, the whole way around the clock. And they were all wrong. Now, what does that mean in Asia today? You look at a situation like Taiwan. The Americans may well believe that they can resist a Chinese military pressure against Taiwan without getting themselves into a full-scale war with China because the Chinese would back off. The Chinese may very well believe that the United States would not do that because the Chinese would back, because the Americans would back off. In other words, neither side wants a war, but both believe they can get what they want without a war because they think the other one will back down. And if they're both wrong, then they both step into a conflict which neither side is then able to get back because once you, as you step into the context, the stakes con conflict, the stakes become higher. So I think the chances of the US and China going to war, not accidentally in the sense that, you know, they both do intend the war, they just both find themselves in a situation where choosing the war is the least bad outcome because they've made, taken prior steps uh, which were based on an underestimate of one another's resolve. And I, I'm very struck by how often in conversations with Americans I, with Americans who are in part of the strategic policy community, the tendency to assume that China would not in the end risk a major war with the United States is very deeply entrenched and I think profoundly mistaken. Under what circumstances would Australia not side with the United States in a war with China? Well, let me change the question a bit. Under what circumstances should Australia not side with the United mm -hmm. States in a war with China? Well, straight off the pin, in a war that we don't think is likely to succeed in achieving its strategic objectives, if we were confident that by supporting the United States in a conflict with China, we could re-establish, reassert American leadership in the region and lead to a durable post-war um, uh, order in which US leadership was established and protected and, endure and enduring, in other words, if we think, believe that fighting a war would take us back to the old status quo that we have known and loved for so long, then there would be an argument for, for fighting that war because that would be a very desirable outcome. But the less confident you are that that was the outcome, the less credible it is that Australia should join such a war, and I think the chances of that outcome are exceptionally low. The United States has no capacity to win a quick, easy victory against the Chinese in a, in a conventional war. And failing that, the risk of stalemate leading to escalation, leading to a nuclear exchange, is very high. Interestingly enough, the first of those propositions, at least, was confirmed even by the US itself in the East Asia Strategy Report they published at the beginning of June this year, where they said, there's not a direct quotation, but that um, the United States no longer has an advantage in the early stages of conflict with China. So the second part of the answer is, it depends what kind of war we're talking about. Now people when they talk and speak in Australia about supporting the United States in a war with China or Iran or anybody else, tend to sort of presuppose that it'll be short and quick and cheap. And, and a war with China will not be that. I think the chance of it becoming a nuclear war for the reasons I've just sketched are really quite high. And so we do need to ask ourselves, would Australia really do that? I personally think we wouldn't. And people who say, as many people in this town do, that we would have no choice are simply wrong. Of course we have a choice. It would be a terrible choice, be a terribly serious thing to do. But we would have a choice. And m my argument would be not just that we shouldn't take part in such a war, but that we should do whatever we can to dissuade the United States from taking part in it. This is a very tough question because you might say, for example, if the issue is Taiwan, well, don't we have an interest in in sustaining Taiwan's democracy against the pressures from an authoritarian China? Yes, we do. But are those interests worth a war with China, which could easily become a nuclear war? 
that's a tough call, but I think the answer is no. And that, of course, is the end of the Australian and alliance with the United States. And it's the end of America's position in Asia. But it's not. My, but the fact is, it works both ways. The United States fights the war with China. It fights it to a stalemate. Its credentials as regional leader are destroyed, and so its its um, position in Asia uh, is undermined, and its value to Australia as an ally is gone anyway. This is the point. There's no there's, there's no easy way around this. Whatever happens, I think we end up with the United States, whether it goes to war with China or backs off. We, we, we end up with an Asia in which the United States ceases to have anything like the strategic weight it's had hitherto. The only way through that, which of, through the future which avoids that, is either that China backs off, which I still think a lot of people in this town and a lot of people in Washington are somehow hoping will happen. That the Chinese will decide that notwithstanding the fact that their economy, despite all the naysayers, keeps on going, not, like, not at 10% per annum, but at 6% per annum, but the Chinese will somehow suddenly decide, oh no, that's okay, we've changed our mind, we're happy to live under, under America's strategic leadership forever. Not very many things in this business that I'm prepared to say will not happen, but I'm going to chance it on that one. That will not happen. The other alternative, of course, is that the US and China do some kind of deal. That the United States preserves a strong strategic role in Asia, but accommodates China's ambitions by giving it more space. Now. Uh, seven years ago. Now I wrote a book that argued that that's exactly what America should do and it's what Australia should argue for. I never even then thought it was a very likely possibility, but I thought it was worth a chance. Now I think it's very unlikely because I just think the time has passed when America has enough negotiating credentials with China to impose on China that kind of deal. That's why I've become so pessimistic about the future of the US role in Asia. Hugh White, thank you. My great pleasure.